Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thank you so much for coming today. We really appreciate it. Um, it's really wonderful to see so many friends and colleagues who work in the spaces of student support and STEM equity um, and all the things that we're really passionate about and we want to talk about today. Um, my name is Jennifer Fields. For those of you who I haven't had the chance to meet yet, I'm the executive director of the Office of Societal Impact, which is an office within Research, Innovation, and Impact. It also houses the STEM Learning Center, an Office of Undergraduate Research, and the Native People's Technical Assistance Office. Um, so we are pleased to be here today to talk about some of the programming that we are involved with. Um, I really would like to thank the sponsor of this event, the Flynn Foundation. Uh, they provided about three years ago a smallish grant, but we all know any money is appreciated, right? That supports some of the elements of the ASEMS program, peer mentoring and faculty mentoring primarily, but also really allowed us to commission two reports to better understand ASEMS best practices and opportunities to scale. Next slide, thank you. I would of course like to start with the University of Arizona's land acknowledgement, uh, which was developed in partnership with tribal communities in the state. We respectfully acknowledge the University of Arizona is on the land and territories of indigenous peoples. Today, Arizona is home to 22 federally recognized tribes with Tucson being home to the Odom and the Yaqui. Committed to diversity and inclusion, the university strives to build sustainable relationships with sovereign native nations and indigenous community communities through education offerings, partnerships and community service. So I would like to briefly introduce our panelists for today. As each gets up to speak, um, we're all gonna share a little bit more about ourselves, our identities, and how we came to work in this space. Um, but I am gonna start with um, the order on the slide rather than at the table. <laughs> so we have Dr. Jenny Batchelder. She's the director for the Arizona Science Engineering and Math Scholars Program, ASEMS as we mostly know it, with the STEM Learning Center. Dr. Noelle Hennessy, who's the director of the Engaged or Engineering Access Greater Equity and Diversity Program in the College of Engineering. Kimberly Sierra Cajas, who is the director of undergraduate research and inquiry under the Office of Societal Impact and also the co-director of the STEM Learning Center. And Dr. Lola Rodriguez Vargas, who's the director for CREAR STEM Learning Communities, also with the STEM Learning Center. So our agenda for today, um, I'm gonna briefly start with a little just context of like the, the national priority of STEM equity and an institutional self-study that we were able to do through a couple of projects we participated in. We're gonna talk about two approaches to applying best practices for persistence in STEM. We'll talk about the HSI servingness as a framework for this work. And then also how we have gone about scaling up some of these best practices. The presentation will last for about an hour and then we'll have about 30 minutes for Q&A. So I'm gonna start with this slide about STEM equity being a national priority. This is the latest incarnation of this, um, but I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my story first because it's relevant to this. So I grew up here in Tucson, Arizona. My father was faculty in the College of Engineering. He was an electrical and computer engineering professor. Um, I graduated Amphi High School 1985, <laughs> um, and then because he was faculty, I mean, tuition was already cheap in that era, but it was free for uh, children and I'm assuming spouses of people who worked here. So I sort of knew I was going to college. It wasn't a question, right? Um, I was always good at math and science. So I started as an electrical and computer engineering major, right? Followed my father's footsteps. I did well, I made the Dean's List for three semesters in a row, and I'm pretty proud of that because I was one of about three women out of about probably 500 students in my engineering EC 101 class. Um, I was an 18 year old girl, so I don't know that I was really aware of the cultural implications and that that was what was making me not feel comfortable there, but I realized it was not for me. So I left engineering, I bounced around. I really loved marine biology, but U of A, right? You're not gonna get a marine biology degree here, right? <laughs> so I ended up getting an accounting degree, wow, which I've never used, um, <laughs> except when I have to make those budgets, right? Um, but 
I also kind of was able to get a second degree in ecology and evolutionary biology. Cause again, I had free tuition. I wasn't going anywhere, anywhere. I just sort of had a job here and was sowing my oats at the U of A. But I did take a humanities course about poverty. Um, and one of the assigned books I still have was an author named Jonathan Cazole called Death at an Early Age. It was written in 1967, but an epilogue was added in 1985. Um, and it was assigned reading for that class. And it was really the first time I really started to understand how educational inequity is manifested in the U of A, that it's we aren't all on a level playing field. We don't all have the same opportunities that I was privileged to have. So still thinking I wanted to be a marine biologist, off to University of Miami, Florida, I go for my graduate degree. I thought I was gonna move to the Caribbean and like run a marine sanctuary or something, right? That was like my dream. But I ended up getting an internship at the Miami Museum of Science who had an NSF funded program. At the time they had a program uh, that was called uh, Women and Minorities in Science that funded the program. Um, and my master's thesis, which I dug off my parents' bookshelf, lo and behold was titled, Using Marine Science Education as a Vehicle for Recruitment of Women and Minorities into Science Careers. This was 27 years ago. At the time it was also a national priority. One of the national education goals was that the United States of America would be first in science and math. And to do so, we had to broaden participation. So that's how I ended up working in this space. Um, at the time, it's kind of funny, I read in my thesis, the National Science Foundation started calling it SMET instead of STEM, but people thought that sounded a little too much like SMUT right? <laughs> so then it became METS and it eventually by about 2001 became STEM. But so it's been a national priority, right? For nearly three decades. But this is the latest incarnation. Um, a, a little less than a year ago, the White House put out this vision statement. I highly encourage you to read it if you have a chance. And then related to that, they launched this um, STEM Opportunity Alliance. Um, and what they think is different this time is it's not just educators. It's they're really reaching out to business, industry, nonprofits, of course, education, but a much bigger list of people with a vested interest. Um, there's a strategic plan. There's opportunities to get involved. If you look at the partnership page, there's a lot of partners that have signed on. So at least it's still at the forefront of the current administration. It's really part of the Chips and Science Act. So Let's hope all that continues. But I just wanted to set that context that while it says a national priority, while it's aiming for 2050, when I started this work, they were aiming for 2000. So um, we're really fortunate here at the University of Arizona to have great da data, access to great data. We're allowed to share it. Lots of other institutionals, other institutions, don't even collect this type of data. They don't disaggregate it. They certainly don't want to share it. So we are fortunate in that way. But I just wanted to give you a quick snapshot of who are STEM students at the U of A. So you can see we have about 13,500 STEM students distributed across colleges, but the majority, almost half of them are in the College of Science. We're about 50-50 um, gender distribution. Nearly 22% are Pell recipients and nearly 30% are first generation students. So you can see we have, um, oh, and then about 36% are from an ethnic group that has been historically excluded in STEM. So nearly half of our STEM students are from a marginalized or minoritized background. So we've been part of a couple programs. Howard Hughes Medical Institute had a driving change program and the Flynn Foundation, as I mentioned, supported some of this work to do an institutional self-study to better understand what the data at the U of A is telling us about STEM. I do wanna say that these findings are pretty typical of STEM culture across universities. It's not to say that U of A is better, worse, different, but this is what the data shows us. So it did reveal that we have some strengths. <laughs> Let's start with the good. We have a huge number of STEM equity and student support programs that are doing great work. We have lots and lots of professional development opportunities for faculty and staff. We have this great, um, a great deal of institutional knowledge and expertise, both on the academic side of house, but also in practice, 
those of us who are staff and who are running programs. Um, there's been a demonstrated ability to get a lot of external grant support for this. When we did this study, the U of A had about $32 million um, just from the NSF EDU directorate. So that doesn't really include even all of the, the external funding supporting this space. Um, and as I already said, there's a lot of access to institutional data and a pretty good structure in place. But here are a few of the highlights that we found. That this is not all inclusive. These are just a couple snippets. Um, we have a lot more data that we can dive into, but about 44% of STEM students say that the university or their department could have done something more to keep them in STEM. Um, some of the things they cited for leaving STEM, institutional practices, faculty attitudes, especially in foundational STEM courses, not feeling that they belonged in STEM, and then the you know ever prevalent in STEM weed out culture that causes a lot of stress. Um, another emerging trend is placement, um, math placement, and not placing in college level math. As you can see, um, over the last four years, it's gone from about 20% to 30% in four years. Um, anecdotally, my own son took pre-calculus in high school, got a decent grade, tested into 112, took the Wildcat LEAP program, still tested into 112. And as a chemistry major, now he's still not able to really start his chemistry classes. So um, it increases the time to graduate. Um, it, uh, it's, a, as I said, a prerequisite for many of the foundational STEM courses. So it nationally is shown to decline persistence in STEM when you don't test into college level math. The data showed disparities across ethnic groups as well as first gen and Pell eligible students. This is an average among eight introductory foundational STEM courses. Um, I won't go through all the data, but as you can see, the yellow highlights are groups for marginalized and minoritized populations. And then this shows first term persistence, second term persistence, and then second year persistence um, across some of the ethnic categories as well. Um, so as you can see, persistence in STEM is a problem, especially into the second year across groups. And then as intersectionalities happen with identity, you can see the disparities increase. So for a female um, underrepresented minority, first gen and Pell eligible only has an 8% chance of graduating from STEM if they did not enter in a STEM major, 57% if they entered in STEM compared to their white male non-first gen, non pal eligible counterpart with an 81% chance, 81 chance of persisting in STEM if they entered. We heard from some student voices in this process, just again to reiterate that like classes were designed to root against me, it's this weed out culture, it stressed me out. I was the valedictorian, I got good grades. Then what happened, I came here. Transfer credits, all sorts of issues we hear from students directly. Um, so some major challenges emerged from the studies. We have a very decentralized and siloed culture, part of what we'll talk about today. Um, not a clear pathways for programs to move from those grant funded opportunities to being institutionally supported. A, a culture problem we talked about, weed out values research. Lots of data, but not really training on how to use it. And a huge lack of centralized planning. Um, so later today, we'll talk about a new initiative we're involved with to create that centralized strategic plan. And now I'm gonna pass it to Jenny Batchelder, who uh, will go next and talk about the ASAPS program. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, uh, I am Dr. Jenny Batchelder. My pronouns are she, her, hers, Elia. I showed up to college as a Chicana Latina from a low-income family with neurodivergence. I wouldn't have made it through my program uh, without the support of the TRIO support, Student Support Services Program. So I truly understand um, personally the value of these types of wraparound services, especially for our STEM scholars. Um, with the, their support and other mentors, I was able to pursue my master's and my PhD in higher education with a focus on college student development and leadership empowerment. So now I get to support this incredible scholars, uh, STEM scholars program, uh, ASIMS. And the data that Jen talked about just now truly tells the story about how we really need to focus on our first generation students from low income families and those underrepresented in STEM so that they can persist, thrive, 
diversify and change our positively change our STEM fields. But this data has been going on for quite a while and something had to be done. So in 20 11, a small group of faculty and staff gathered together to voluntarily support a pilot study who co connected with 12 scholars from first generation and low income backgrounds to get them through their programs. And that ASIMS program has grown tremendously over the years. And we now average supporting 130 incoming scholars every year with a diverse staff of, of ASIMS staffs who supports 450 students throughout their academic journey. Each student receives wraparound services that are based on that are evidence-based practices. And the four that we focus on are having an asset-based mentoring opportunity, which gives students culturally responsive and uh, inclusive enga engagement opportunities to connect with their peers. We also engage them early in undergraduate research and cultural and uh, undergraduate research and other STEM career preparation programs to help empower their STEM identities. Also understanding this population, we know that they're gonna need extra support with academics and financial aid. So our success specialists are trained in those areas and we include some interventions, including grade reports and tutoring services to help them there. And our learning communities that we create gives the students a chance to connect with others from underrepresented backgrounds to, to create community and to learn about resources to help them succeed, succeed and overcome barriers to persist. Now, all of those services and more contributes to the effectiveness of our programs. The data tells us we are strong in persistence and graduation. For the most recent class who started 2019, 20, 21, and 22, the first gen low income students, I thought I'd share some comparison information for you. Our first time, first year persistence for STEM specifically, one year rate in ASIMS is 85 with our general ASIMS comparative students only at 78%. Their third year persistence rate is 77% versus 65. Now our transfer program started in uh, 2015 and our one year persistent rate for those students is 92% versus 78. And the three year persistent rate is 66 to 57. Our graduation rate at the six year rate is um, for first time first year students in STEM is 74%, which is 8% higher than our um, non uh, ASIM scholars. Other services that we've been able to be effective in that are named by our students themselves in the Flynn Foundation study that we were able to do in 2022, they described how having a positive mentor experience gave them confidence to know not only did they have somebody to talk to, but somebody that really understood what it meant to be first generation or low income and or underrepresented um, to help them persist and pursue their degree. Early engagement in undergraduate re um, research also was very powerful. We introduced this opportunity to every scholar. Um, most all take advantage of that opportunity, but not everyone wants to pursue that career. But this in our study showed that they still felt that that experience gave them confidence to persist in STEM. And the third thing they talked about specifically was graduate school preparation and matriculation. Those aspects um, of the program help them to see themselves in graduate school and apply when they don't even they didn't even know that was an opportunity. Um, one third of our students do continue on to matriculate into graduate school. With all of this information and more, we've been nationally recognized by the, uh, the Excellencia Education Program as an ex example of excellence for the baccalaureate category for high persistence in STEM for Hispanic serving students. This and other recognition is incredible, but we do know there's still so much to do, and that can be done with incredible partners, some of you in the audience, but I'll pass it on to Noel to continue the story. Good. Is it afternoon? Good after it is afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Noelle Hennessy. I use she, her pronouns. And um, I um, also came to college as a first generation college student. Um, also felt some of these same experiences of um, not being sure what I didn't know. 
like not knowing what I didn't know, but what I really needed to know. I didn't study STEM. I feel like I should put that out there right at the beginning. Um, <laughs> I have, um, I got a degree in communication. I moved, um, on to get a master's and a PhD in higher education, leadership and policy. And, um, and I, started working in the College of Engineering just as like a student affairs position, wanting to support STEM students and uh, wanting to support engineering students and really have learned a lot of the nuances about the um, the curriculum and the opportunities for, um, for access or lack thereof in engineering education. So I'm gonna start my story from when we started the Catapult program. Um, Catapult started in 2016 as a means to admit students um, into the College of Engineering who demonstrated a high performance in their high school grades and an obvious interest in um, STEM from the classes that they, they took in high school, but whose um, standardized test scores didn't really match what we were looking for in um, preparedness for the rigorous engineering curriculum. And so we admitted students um, into this cohort and we um, created research informed experiences for them including community-based um, cohort classes and peer mentors and faculty student interactions. And so those first year linked community courses um, really created um, a sense of belonging and a built-in study group for students. Um, they also created what we call a psychological or a, a um, sense of enhanced psychological safety in the classroom. So ability to ask questions, to ask um, questions of their peers, but also to speak up, to ask questions of their instructor. Um, and so, and then the peer mentor component was originally just meant for there to be just a student, a near peer to kind of shepherd new students through. And what it evolved into was um, what I kind of refer to as our peer mentor and peer advisory board. They're really helping to provide credible feedback for the professionals um, to really understand what students need. I think that's a really important takeaway is that culturally responsive programming really honors the knowledge that students bring to the table and implements that use, using your own political capital in the institution to implement that. And so fast forward to the year 2020 and the institution as a whole stopped requiring um, standardized test scores for admissions. But in those four years that we had collected data for the Catapult program, we really saw that students who um, were Pell recipients in the Catapult program persisted to the second year at a statistically significantly higher rate than Pell recipients not in the Catapult program in the College of Engineering. So we were kind of seeing a pattern here and we made it an opt-in program that we're really hoping to push more towards students for whom the interventions seem to be effective. And so that um, peer advisory board, I'm gonna kind of come back to that um, here because one thing that it really did was help to inform what additional programs we needed. We focused a lot on the first year because um, an entire economy of um, college ratings focuses on the first year and persistence to the second year. But we, we know that the first year isn't getting a degree, it's just getting through the first year. And so what are the other things that students needed? And that's how two of our other programs that eventually became the engaged suite of programs emerged. And so Summer Track was a summer term program that was really modeled after that Catapult cohort program, where we focused on helping students recover time towards graduation by taking some of those foundational math and science courses as a cohort over the summer. And then we also gave them an, a career development class. So whereas in the first year, we really talked about um, how to get through college and how to learn college, we really wanted to um, develop an engineering identity with students and really be able to show them uh, in what their day-to-day -day would look like as an engineer. So we brought them out to regional engineering employers and we got them professional mentors and that was really cool. Um, and then and that's, that program emerged in 2021. And then Real Work was another program that came out in 2021. And it was also responding to students' needs for experiential learning and the ability to really identify as an engineer. And what better way to do that than right here on a Research One campus? Um, and so what we really, um, one barrier to engaging in undergraduate research is that many faculty members don't really know what to do with a student who hasn't taken advanced coursework. They don't know how to create um, research or research adjacent tasks. They don't necessarily have to know um, great strategies for communicating with students who are in the earlier years of their coursework. And so really being able to address those barriers and challenges, we wanted to create a bridge between students and faculty. And we really wanted to be able to pay students for their work too, because that's another barrier for um, engaging in 
anything extra outside of school is that, um, you know, work is work, right? We really want to make sure that students have the ability to engage in something and, not, and for the, the cost of their time not to be a barrier to engagement, especially in developing an engineering identity. And so these were really the ways these programs have allowed us to uh, think critically about how we bring services to students and how we try to achieve STEM equity. So speaking of serving, I like this framework. I know Marla likes this framework. <laughs> um, um, we are an Hispanic serving institution. Um, Dr. Regina Garcia developed this framework for understanding organizational cultures of Hispanic serving institutions. And so this is an interesting framework to conceptualize different ways that institutions engage in the work of serving Latinx students. But I think it's worth pointing out we're in STEM equity. We're not just in like Latinx advancing STEM equity, but um, HSI serve larger numbers of Black, Native American, and Asian Pacific Islander students than pr prim, um, primarily white institutions. And so even by the virtue of being an HSI, you're actually serving a really, really diverse um, crowd of students. And it, so you can apply this. We are an HSI, so we should be applying this framework irrespective of that fact. But you can apply this framework in STEM equity work out anywhere um, in, in, in the context of um, of advancing students in STEM. And so if you don't know, um, in Hispanic to be an Hispanic serving institution, enrollment is the minimum. You have to enroll at least 25% Latinx undergraduate students and, and um, at least 50% of your undergraduate students have to be eligible for a Pell Award. Marla, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm right, great. <laughs> um, it's so nerve wracking having her there. <laughs> um, um, and so, Enrollment is the minimum, but this framework really helps us to see that producing Latinx students is really kind of going to the next level of really making sure that Latinx students are supported academically and getting through their degrees, but producing is not necessarily enhancing their cultural identity. Um, meanwhile, enhancing cultural identities, so creating a for supportive communities, affirming practices, engaging students in service is affirming their cultural identity, but is not necessarily linked to better academic performance and graduation rates. And so really marrying these two concepts is what servingness is, is what, to, what it is to be a Latinx serving institution. It's what we're really trying to do in our um, STEM equity work. And so um, servingness doesn't happen in a bubble. I think that's what we've really come to realize in our conversations as a group here is that in order to do this work, we have to establish partnerships across the institution. And these partnerships are not just, um, can you please do this task for me? Can you please enroll students in this class because I'm trying to group them as a cohort? The partnerships have to be an authentic understanding, a shared understanding of what we're trying to accomplish as a culturally responsive serving program. Um, we need to be um, engaging in conversations with our um, partners across campus and other stakeholders about not just what we're doing, but why we're doing it and what they're doing as what, what their contribution means. And so um, um, I'm going to pass it to Kimberly, who can really kind of speak to how we are working to break out of some of our institutional silos and engage in some more meaningful partnerships. Thank you so much, Noelle. So I'm wearing a mask because my kids happened to get sick yesterday. <laughs> so I'm trying to protect you all. Um, I, what we've been doing so far is really laying the groundwork, you know, really talking about the foundation so that now for the second half of the presentation, we're going to go into how we've been scaling up the best practices. So I'm Kimberly Sierra Cajas. I go by, um, I use the pronouns she, her, and I was a first generation college student as well. I was a Pell Grant recipient, and I was one of the only students of color in my engineering program at my university. And I studied industrial engineering, so I love looking at systems, how systems work, and where you can make improvement in, improvements in systems, especially people systems. And I used to run a diversity and STEM collaborative for many years where we would bring together different um, programs that were focused on diversity and STEM or different staff that were focused on or really passionate about diversity and STEM. I was also the founding director of the ASEMS program. And so over the years, just 
I really noticed so many similarities between different programs around campus that were um, focused on diversity in STEM. You know, a lot of us, the, the staff that are working on these programs are so passionate about the work. We're really passionate. We are, a lot, a lot of us are from similar backgrounds as the students that we're serving. And so we understand the students' experiences. And also, um, we are always looking for ways to improve the programs. We're looking at how to meet the students' needs and we're continually growing the programs. You can see <laughs> Noelle was kind of like a one person show and she just kept growing and growing the program. And ASEMS has been growing and growing and um, uh, addressing uh, the additional uh, student populate that we've had increased student populations at the U of A. Uh, more students are coming from marginalized backgrounds and also there's greater student needs. So the thing is, is that th this is hard work. <laughs> I think many of you will probably agree. And I see so many of our partners and our collaborators and our evaluators and our researchers out here. So thank you very much for coming. But many of you know how hard this work is. And so, you know, it's been, I, I've noticed that many of us are um, implementing these programs in similar ways. We have similar operational functions that it takes to deliver to implement these programs. And so what could we do to come together and try to connect some of the programs? So Noelle and I had been talking for several years, noticing you know, some of the similarities in our best practices and trying to figure out if there were ways that we could make things easier. <laughs> Like, can we make things easier on us, but still deliver deliver the same high quality um, programming to the students? So we had um, brainstormed and um, decided that it was time to try to figure out how we could systematize our best practices. So let me um, go to the next slide. So thank goodness we um, received some uh, funding from the Flynn Foundation to study and identify the ASIN's best practices that could be scaled up. And then we also received the Title III HSI STEM and Articulation Grant Project CREAR. CREAR stands for Culturally Responsive Engagement Articulation in Research, and I am the PI. It's a U.S. Department of Education grant to remove barriers in STEM, with the ultimate goal being to increase persistence in graduation rates in STEM of Latinx students and students from low-income households. So what we decided um, is that we were going to focus on scaling up three best practices. One was um, increasing access, increasing early access to undergraduate research. Second, to cultivate culturally responsive and inclusive STEM environments and to scale up STEM learning communities. Both Catapult and ASEMS had been offering STEM learning communities in different ways. So one thing that Project CREAR was able to do is to hire staff that were not associated with our programs. So like Dr. Lola uh, Rodriguez Vargas um, is going to talk about in a little bit, she came from, she had an outside perspective. So she didn't have any particular tie to either of our programs and she could really look at what parts of our programs could be operationalized and connected. And so she'll talk about that in a little bit. So the first best practice that I'm going to talk about is um, how we are expanding early access to research through CURES. And CURE stands for Course-Based Undergraduate Research Experience. So this is where faculty incorporate authentic research experiences into courses. Uh, you can serve many more students that way instead of the one-on-one -on -one apprenticeship type of position. And also apprenticeship positions have many barriers that um, are more of a disadvantage to students from marginalized backgrounds. So um, it especially affects students who are first generation who might not um, know any researchers or might not know anybody who does research. They might not understand how to get into research positions because sometimes there's a lot of hidden rules about how to get into research. And only a lot of times only the proactive students who go and talk to the faculty members are the ones who get into those positions or the students with the highest GPAs. So we um, wanted to really promote cures as a way to also create more equitable access to research. So CureNet is a national network of cures, or to, that, a national network that supports cures. 
And their definition of cures um, is that they involve whole classes of students in addressing a research question or a problem of interest to stakeholders outside of the classroom. And during a cure, students engage in the scientific process. So this image shows the different elements of a scientific process and most cures will address several of these um, practices. So what we've been doing is offering for the last four years, an annual cure training institute. This is a two and a half day workshop that's talk, taught by Dr. Sarah Brunell, who is a national expert in cures, a national, she's nationally known for studying undergraduate research. She's from ASU. And we've been um, providing funding, a little bit of funding to faculty to learn how to develop a cure. And so far 17 cures have been taught. Um, several of them have been taught multiple times. So actually there's been 30 in, more than 30 instances of cures taught. And this has served over 1,100 students so far. That, that's 1,100 new research positions that we didn't have before. 63% of these students um, are, were first generation Pell Grant recipients or students from an underrepresented ethnic group. And 50% of them were students who were um, in their first or second year at the U of A. And which is fantastic because undergraduate research um, has been proven through numerous studies to um, have a positive impact on retention. However, STEM students, if they're leaving STEM, they leave, if they're leaving STEM or they leave the university, they're leaving within the first two years. And most undergraduate research positions are targeted for students in their third or fourth year. So we wanted to focus cures on students in their first or second year to actually have an impact on retention. And through the Title III grant, we are funding the conversion of two STEM labs. So the first one is ECOL 182, and that is our Biology II lab, and then one more that will be determined. And we are, there's nine more additional cures that are in development. So this year alone, there'll be over 1,700 students that will get an authentic research experience. Um, yes, 1,300 of them are from the Biology II lab, um, and after we uh, convert the second lab, there'll be many more, hopefully maybe a thousand more students. So we'll be able to greatly increase the number of research experiences. And 39 faculty, staff, postdocs, and grad students have already attended the Cure Training Institute. So next I'm gonna talk about how we're cultivating culturally responsive and inclusive environments, inclusive environments in STEM. We partnered with Dr. Judy Marquez Kiyama who had created the Culturally Responsive Curriculum Development Institute the year before. It's called the CRCDI. And that is where faculty are learning how to incorporate culturally responsive pedagogy into their courses. What we are doing is we're funding STEM faculty to attend the Institute. So we're increasing the number of faculty that can attend. Um, College of Science has actually matched the stipend. So many of the STEM faculty that have attended are from College of Science. We also were focused on um, the STEM gateway courses. When we pulled data for the grant, many of the students who were earning um, a D, an E, which is a failing grade, or a W, which means that they withdrew from the class, or so a DE or W, many of those students were, um, too many of them were, for, were Latinx students. And so there was a, definitely a big gap. So we wanted to make sure that this, the environments in those classes were more inclusive and welcoming and um, also acknowledge their um, cultural backgrounds, their identities, um, recognized that these students are a major part of the class too. So uh, the courses that have had faculty that attended um, include general chemistry one, general chemistry two, and the supplemental instruction courses for each of those courses. Uh, the biology two lab, the biology two lecture, and then the biology, the intro to biology one course. And um, there are additional STEM focused courses that are not identified as STEM, or as gateway courses um, from speech language hearing sciences, from nursing, um, a computer programming class, and from psychology. So through this effort, over 8,000 students have been reached. Um, so we're really excited about that. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Lola Rodriguez Vargas, who's going to talk about the second effort um, for this best practice. Hola, everyone. How are we doing so far? Good? You're there with us? As Kimberly said, I'm really excited to see a lot of you. Um, I feel that you know this work very well, but it's exciting to join in so that you see more of it. As Kimberly said, I'm Dr. Lola Rodriguez Vargas, and for those that don't know me, 
I am born and was born and raised in Puerto Rico. I have an undergraduate degree in industrial microbiology and a master's in biology with a focus in microbial ecology. And I'm a proud HSI graduate. I always share that because I had such a wonderful experience being a graduate of La Universidad de Puerto Rico, Mayagüez, that I just hope that I can create similar environments to the students here of what I had there in Puerto Rico. I'm very passionate about the work that we do and I'm excited to do it with all of you and with these women. My pronouns are she, her, ella. And I want also to continue talking a little bit about the culturally responsive initiatives in this case for the inclusive student as staff training. And of course we don't do this work alone. In the case of this training, it is being led by a PhD of higher education and graduate student, grant batch holder. And what we are doing through this initiative is that we are doing two separate trainings, one for student leaders and one for staff. And we need your assistance. We wanna recruit more folks to participate in these trainings. They have already launched. So the student leader, leader training is targeting any student leader that interfaces and works with STEM students, such as peer mentors, peer advisors, preceptors, TAs, and such. And we are also working on an asynchronous training to be offered through edge learning, but we definitely recommend the in-person if you have capacity to do that. And the second portion is the staff training. And in the same manner, we know that a lot of our staff interfaces with STEM students. It does not necessarily have to be staff that are in a STEM program. So if you are serving our STEM students, we wanna work with you and equip your staff to extend their knowledge in culturally responsive initiatives. So contact us so we can schedule a training. And in our next slide, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about developing the ASEMS network. You've heard from our team here, a lot of the work that has been doing they have been doing before. And when we brought all of our initiatives together, a lot of people started getting a little confused because they know our partners in separate. And now we're working together as a team with an umbrella titled the ASEMS Network, where we house the ASEMS program, Catapult, and the Crear STEM Learning Communities. So the team had gathered input from stakeholders such as staff, college administrators, students, and continues to do so. And the way that we are identifying these elements of the folks that are working with us and the initiatives that had been working already so great, we are just identifying specific initiatives that we wanted to scale up to address the needs of a larger number of students. These included the first year seminar course in Catapult and ASIMS linked courses or the formation of the cohorts, the services provided by the support staff, the peer mentors and supplemental instruction. And here you're gonna see uh, an amazing photo. I love this, this is from our website. And this is from one of the areas that we are scaling up, which is the first semester seminar. So in general, one of the things that we are seeking to do through the ASEMS network is consolidate some of the services. For example, recruitment, marketing, the scheduling of the courses, the arranging, arranging the linked courses through the departments, the registration of the students into cohorts. But specifically, one of the practices that had been really successful was our, the first year seminar being led by ASEMS, the success in STEM. So we, through the Title III grant, we were able to onboard and have as part of our team, a curriculum and training manager joining us today, Chris Oka. And Chris has been leading the training for peer educators to lead the class. So we transformed the curriculum together with the team. And something that I feel that we haven't mentioned enough is that our practices are research and evidence-based. So everything that we are doing for our programs is backed by practices that are doing great and a national level in education and we're bringing them here so even if we were doing things 10 years ago we are revamping them and continue to inform them with the research and this is what happen is happening through the peer educators and the success in stem and one important thing to see in here is that the focus continues to be increasing the sense of belonging of our student population as well as their stem identity and in the next slide it's something that it's really close to my heart, really important to mention that we do engage with high impact practices, but if you know a little bit about higher education research, there's a little bit of controversy about high impact practices and who has access to these practices and how they are being delivered. So something that we do that is very important and different, I feel, at a national level is the culturally responsive approach that we do for our practices. So we have taken things that have been working for over a decade, but we're taking a closer look to see how we can support the staff 
that is across the university, not only our staff, to increase that environment and that culturally responsive practice that was already happening via ASIMS and Catapult. Those two practices are the learning communities and the senior coordinator that leads that initiative is Andrea Palacio, which is as Noel mentioned, something that Catapult had already been doing really great, which is cohorting the students in one or more classes so that they can find each other and we can build that sense of community, sense of belonging, as well as the STEM identity and the first year seminar. And in the next slide, as you are, I'm so excited again to see you here. You know of this work, but the purpose of us gathering today is talking about the strategic partnerships and the ways that we are scaling up what we are doing. So as Kimberly mentioned, the work in the beginning, way in the beginning was very isolated and folks were doing similar things across campus, but not necessarily articulated in a way that we would join forces and reach more students. So one thing that we have learned in the past uh, year and a half with talking with national partners, other universities and conferences and meetings with the Department of Education is that initiatives that are small and are isolated are going to have lower impact that if we are able to join in with folks across campus so that we understand what the vision is and where we're headed. And as Noel mentioned and Marla clearly articulated, if we gather around servingness and if we gather in this instance through STEM equity and sense of belonging and STEM identity and our walking towards that path, we are able to scale up these initiatives. And these are just some of our partners. I, I wanna mention them by name. We are able to work with Think Tank, the A Center, the College of Science specifically, the chemistry and math, as well as their student success areas, the College of Agricultural, Environmental and Life Sciences, the College of Engineering, general education faculty, special mention to the Mexican American studies area and instructors, the Office of the Registrar, Enrollment Management, University Information Technology and Services, and Wildcat Leave, just to mention a few. And if we go to the next slide, what we also want to underscore today is that what we're doing through the CREAR STEM Learning Communities, which is that program that offers the first year seminar with linked courses, this is one of the services that we provide under the ASEMS network. So that's the first semester experience. And then the students move on as a pathway to the different services through the College of Engineering and ASEMS to provide services that you already heard about today that Noel and Jenny mentioned. So we are going to really hone together and increase the capacity. Right now, we increase capacity from about 125 students that we were already directly serving to increasing capacity to about 450 with the goal of reaching more and more students as the demographics of the university continue to change. We wanna make sure that we change with it. And another really special thing that we are able to do through the Title III and Jen mentioned in the beginning is that we are data-based. So we have a team of evaluation support that makes sure that we have all the good data that we need to continue doing this work. And lastly, I wanna invite you in to partner with us. So we cannot do this on our own. And if you're here, it's because you're either curious or already passionate about STEM equity. And just to sum up what I've said, what we are trying to do is to identify and collaborate with programs that work with student success, that are interested in strengthening sense of belonging, which I define as perceived support, connectedness, and mattering for the students, as well as the STEM identity, the development of a social identity as a scientist and the self-perception as a scientist for the students. So we are looking forward to being able to continue partnering with you and extend the services to more students. I'll leave you with Kimberly for concluding remarks. I wanted to acknowledge a few people. This um, this Title III Project CREAR, could, we would not have been able to secure this grant without the support, um, the, the very strong support from Jen Fields and from Marla Franco and Courtney Coffey. Um, they <laughs> were part of the team that brought together the, uh, the grant writers and brought several of us together to brainstorm ideas. And so I just really want to acknowledge their support. And so this crowd grant created the infrastructure for us to take some of our common operational functions, connect them together to be able to scale up some of our other best practices. We've been able to increase the number of students that we're serving and hopefully continue to increase the number of students we're serving. Um, you know, it really took a lot of uh, um, 
we had to really come together and and consider everybody's input and try to figure out what we could incorporate, what wasn't going to be possible, try to do the best job that we could to to bring all of these ideas together, which is not easy. <laughs> and, you know, we're still learning and we're still evaluating and um, improving. So I want to thank also all of the ASIM staff for their patience <laughs> as we've been <laughs> really modifying and we, you know, it really takes a core group of people to be willing to let go of the way things have always been, been done. And that is really difficult. And so I think that's one of the reasons why programs stay small, why programs continue to operate on their own. You know, we have to really let go of our egos to do what's best for the students. And I think we have such an amazing group of people that are really willing to and so passionate to do what's best for the students. So um, I do want to promote our STEM equity mixer that's on December 6th. You have a QR code that's on the table. Uh, there's a QR code on the slide. And then also there's going to be a link posted in the chat box for those that are on the webinar. And let's see, oh yes, we'll send out the recording and the slides from uh, this event. For those who are listening on the webinar, we'll send that out in about a week. And now we're going to have 30 minutes for discussion. Do you want to come moderate? <laughs> and Jen is going to moderate. So think of any questions that you might have, any details that you might want to hear more about. Thank you. Uh, before we jump into questions, I'll give you a chance to think of your questions if you don't have any already. Um, one of the things we're going to launch at this mixer is that the University of Arizona has invested in becoming an institutional cohort member of the AAAS Sea Change Program. This is a, a project where institutions are asked to do an institutional self-study, so we've done much of that already. There's a little more data we want to collect. But then to really create an institution-wide strategic plan for STEM equity. And so we'll talk about that initiative. And when I say the university has invested, like there's a fee to be part of this program, it is it is a certification program. So uh, as we go through the process, the University of Arizona has the potential to be designated as sort of a STEM equity certified institution. And the levels of certification can grow as we continue to achieve our goals. But if you are someone who is interested in learning more about that project or certainly being part of the project in terms of helping us to define a true strategic plan that we will put forth to the institutional leadership. Um, I really welcome you all to come. Please spread the word. Um, we want as many minds thinking about this strategic plan as possible. And I think it's um, a real opportunity to make some of the types of systemic and systematic changes, institution-wide changes, and embed these practices across the university so that they're not always in these smaller programs and these grant funded initiatives, but so that the institution truly embeds this work in the way it, it serves students. So um, I welcome any questions. Uh, if you have one, raise your hand and Emily, I think will come, someone will come, Cara will come to you with the microphone. Comments, anything? Don't be shy. We all know each other pretty well. <laughs> Thank you. There's always a brave first person. Okay, I think this is on. Um, so we have plenty of ambassador programs on campus that invite students who are considering our institution for their education. And I'm wondering if there's any potential training, such as that culturally responsive training that we can use for our ambassador programs to invite them into those programs that we want them enrolling in. Although enrolling is that lower level or that lower tier, it's gonna lead to that service tier. We are very fortunate to have the support of the Title III grant because uh, a lot of services across the university require funds to be able to provide these trainings and we have capacity right now. So we would be delighted. Anyone that wants to participate in the trainings is welcome to sign up. They just have to uh, coordinate with us and we would be, that, that's exciting. Thank you, Maricruz. We would be delighted. Mm -hmm. And I'll just add to that, that we are working with RII's training and development department to 
um, find ways to sustain these trainings even after the grant ends by having them on edge learning, whether they're um, synchronous, asynchronous, some blend of in-person and online learning activities. But we really, our goal is to sustain these even after the grant. We have a question online. I see, oh, Manny Leon says, I see the wonderfully positive data on how these practices have affected students, but I'm wondering if there is also data on how faculty and staff who have been involved have changed how they view equity and how they approach working with diverse students outside of these specific programs. <laughs> We have some of our evaluators <laughs> who are <laughs> collecting information about um, the faculty, uh, the impact on faculty. So Rachel Lee here has her the their team here. I don't know how many people you have here, but oh yes. Um, <laughs> so they have been collecting input from faculty on a separate project that we have through an STEM grant with NSF. We have um, an inclusive mentor mentoring program for STEM faculty. And so they have been collecting input about um, the impact on faculty. Uh, and then also Dr. Adriana Semeta and Dr. Rebecca Friesen have been collecting input um, from faculty about the Cure Training Institute. And so what, they, what they've been thinking about that and the impact on students who have been part of the cures. Um, do you all wanna say anything about what, <laughs> some of the comments? Yeah, can you pass it to um, Rachel? No? Oh, there we are. Um, yeah, so we use a survey that comes out of UW-Madison, uh, the Symer survey, I'm not thinking of the actual acronym. But so we gather data both on changes in attitudes, but also we look at changes over time in their actual practices um, with these faculty who participate. So I don't, off the top of my mind, I can't spout any stats, but yeah, there's definitely a real increase in their implementation of these kind of key practices around inclusive mentoring. So we have reports, um, you know, we are willing, willing to share some of the information from the reports. Um, there's something else that I'm, oh yes. And also with the CRCDI, um, uh, Judy, Dr. Judy marquez Giama and her grad student are also collecting information from the faculty who have participated in that. So there's a lot of data that's being collected. Um, so there, I'm sure they'll be producing some papers about that. And there's somebody, oh yeah, Adriana or Rebecca, do you wanna have, you know, want to say anything about the cures, what, what faculty are saying? <laughs> uh, yeah, so the, the cure faculty, um, it's not as directed of intense mentorship, but more of curricular design and how to d redesign or newly design courses to reach a broad, uh, group of students and get them interested in STEM. And so rethinking what assessment looks like, rethinking what they expect their students to learn. And it may not be as product driven, more the process that they're going through and what they're learning and walking away with. I was just going to say, there's one session in the CARE training that consistently is considered the most popular, and that is the one on equity. Um, faculty love that session. They always say how much they learn about, uh, um, during it. So, And I'll add a little more information. As part of the full institutional self-study, we did collect some data around faculty engagement, um, particularly in things like the faculty learning communities. And I will say that CALS, or now CALS, overwhelmingly participates the most in faculty learning communities. Um, but also it tends to be across the board largely um, instructional faculty and not tenure track faculty that are participating in professional development activities, faculty learning communities, these sorts of things. Um, as part of the self-study, we developed a faculty survey to go out to STEM faculty that really tries to get at the heart of what they feel their responsibility is for student success. As we talked about, there's a culture here that really values research often over teaching and student support and service. 
Um, we weren't able to, it's quite the process to get a survey approved and get it out. We weren't quite able to do that for um, the study, but as part of this AAAS program that I just mentioned, we're gonna bring that survey back around and actually get it out to STEM faculty and collect more data about that. Thank, thank you. Um, I just want to commend you guys for having the foresight to like ask how can we join forces because there's such a need and you know by combining what you're doing and looking to scale it you're going to be able to help more students which is what you're doing so uh, thank you for all your presentations and for just having the foresight and the energy to to join forces. Um, one of you guys made the comment about how uh, partnerships um, need to be based on a shared understanding on why we are doing this. And as you look to scale up and bring more, maybe particularly STEM faculty into the projects that you guys have going on, this is a question is like, what is that going to look like in terms of like um, inviting people in to like, you know, share some of the rationales for, you know, like you said, what what is your responsibility for student success and inviting them in in a way that um, they are curious, maybe they haven't thought about it, but they get curious and then they show up and maybe decide that they're going to do the Cure Institute or what have you. So it's kind of a nebulous question, but I just wanted to put it out there. <laughs> So I think I was the one that made that comment about inviting people in for the why. And I I think for, for me, how I've been trying to approach it is to really look at these experiences as not just experiences where we're supporting students, but experiences where, where the faculty and instructional staff and um, administrative staff and everybody who's involved is also supported by our team. And so rather than saying, we just want you to do this thing. Please don't screw it up. Um, <laughs> we want to kind of bring people in and say, this is what we're doing. And, and we know that there will be challenges along the way. And so like you have us like where we can be this connector um, and try or interpreter or a um, um, uh, per person to bounce ideas off of. So they don't have to feel like they're in a silo with, with their group of students figuring out what, what is it that I'm even doing here? So I think it's rather than thinking about it as helping them see, like kind of just didactically telling them what the why is really just helping them feel like they're part of a team um, and that they have support people to, to help them do their job well. Um, so that would, that's been my approach. I don't know so much about how to bridge that. I haven't been strategic enough to think about how to get them to think, oh, now I want to be in the Cure Institute. And I, but I think it's just one step at a time, helping them feel supported. I think that's generally what we're doing with students too, just one semester at a time, helping them feel supported and, and empowered to do the next thing. Does anyone else have it? I have a couple different comments. So one, is that we're putting a lot of funding into converting the STEM labs. And we have made it pretty much a requirement that the person who is leading the, the instructor or faculty member who is in charge of that particular STEM lab, we are asking them to go to the CRCDI. So we want the STEM, the cures also to be culturally responsive and inclusive research environments. Um, another thing I was going to mention is that when people are working on proposals to look at what already exists, <laughs> what programs you can partner with and maybe branch off on, in, branch off of instead of trying to create something brand new. And so many times we see people recreating the wheel and then maybe they'll hire a half-time staff person and expect them to run an entire program and carry out all of the operational functions on their own. And then people are burned out. And one thing that we all have noticed is that when people are writing proposals, they have no idea how much time and effort it takes to run these efforts. And it becomes really unfair for the staff and staff are get so burned out. So please, please, please think about how you can partner um, 
you know, what we, one thing we've been doing with ASIMS and also I know Noel has been doing this with Engaged is trying to plug in people into what we already have. Um, that's kind of how ASIMS has kept growing. <laughs> We've had we have several different kinds of cohorts of students, but um, this is just one way so that you can tap into the um, operational infrastructure that we've already created. Um, and then I'll just add part of the strategic planning, of course, is going to look at practices and policies that that seek to change some of the the culture that's here. So particularly for tenure track faculty who are still working towards tenure, they get a lot of messages from their departmental or college leadership, not across the board, but we all have heard stories about this, the, where they're getting messages, kind of don't, don't spend your time doing, you know, that work, it's not going to count towards tenure, publications, grants, research results, like that's your bread and butter. Um, so part of it is thinking strategically about how to change that culture, change practices and policies, change reward structures um, so that there is more equitable value placed on research, teaching, and service. I also wanted to make a, an additional comment that the things that we are equipping folks to do, I get really excited that Whenever you're talking about diversity, equity, inclusion, social justice, you think about bringing in experts and we have the experts at the university. This university has so many resources and I'm specifically thinking about our uh, part of our grant, Dr. Judy Marquez Quillama and so many folks at the higher education program, uh, educational psychology program. We have folks that this is their research. So we are in the midst of new knowledge that is being created that informs our work and changing the mindset of folks believing that maybe if they work in marketing or if they work very far removed from students, they do not need so much to learn about culturally responsive pedagogy or practices because they're not teaching. And I get excited about assisting everyone in understanding that the entire university needs to be informed in these practices because everything from a flyer to curriculum, to programming, to face-to-face -face financial aid, everything needs to be informed by culturally responsive practices. So just sharing that enthusiasm of we are among the experts and we get to learn from them is something that is really exciting. And I feel that it moves our work forward and it makes it a bit easier. Uh, I'm going to put Noel on the spot. <laughs> so you mentioned that Catapult started with students who maybe performed one of the high, well in the high school, but not on standardized testing. Um, I was wondering that was specific to PSAT and ACT score or SAT and um, ACT scores and what happened when we became test optional? How do you then shift your practices for inviting students into those programs or similar programs? And how can recruitment teams across STEM majors use or communicate um, the programs to maybe students as they meet them that they might identify as potential participants for them? So even from its inception, Catapult never really framed its work, or I never framed the work of Catapult as um, you just need this extra help or you need to catch up or whatever. I mean, that was sort of how it was framed so that we could get these students admitted, but that was never really the message that we um, used in the programming. So the, the programming really hasn't changed. Um, and what, what has changed is that, that we get to just promote it and, and talk about like, look at this cool thing that we're doing and students opt into it because students opt into a lot of things that are really meant to support them and help them. As long as you're framing it that way is like, we think you're cool and we, we wanna make sure you stay here. Um, and so that's why students opt into New Start and that's why students opt in, have, have been opting into ASEMS. And so that was like the, the use of standardized test scores was really a barrier to access in engineering. And, and so it was a way to take that barrier down like a few bricks at a time. And it was a really cool, I mean, the pandemic was not that cool at all, but what was cool was that we got to, it was, it was a catalyzer for what was already happening at more elite institutions across the country, which was that we weren't looking at test scores as these 
you know, all determining factors for a student's preparedness and readiness. And we're all ultimately looking at what are we doing as instructors and educators to bring students along wherever they start in their journey. And so, yeah, the, the approach didn't really change. I think to, to speak to your question about recruitment, you know, I think it, I think we're already doing stuff to recruit students into asset-based programming that we could really look to. I look at Newstart as a, as a major partner because they were already doing the kind of work that I wanted to be doing um, long, long, long before the pandemic and obviously long before um, Catapult even started. So I really look at the way that they market their programs and the way that they talk about how they build community and help students really get that leg up and that, 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 early start to college and really kind of model the way that I try to market Catapult in the same way. Um, what's unique about both of those programs is that it's not really excluding anyone, but it is zeroing in on who they are really focused on to inviting. And so, um, you know, anybody can apply for a new start, um, but they have the, the pedagogy and the curriculum is really focused on students who are first generation and low income and, and generally historically marginalized students. And that's really what we've focused on with the catapult programming as well. Um, so I, I don't know if this is answer your question, Marie Cruz. You could have just asked me offline, but okay. <laughs> um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, bear down. My name is um, Lou Vega. I am a proud um, graduate of um, Pueblo High School, so I have my PhD. I'm also a proud graduate and a scholar of the New Start Summer Program. Also a former employee, student employee for the Office of Early Academic Outreach. So a big shout out to Rudy B. McCormick III and Manny Leon, who asked the question earlier. So let's get down to the business of this. My son, who is a 13-year-old, my daughter, who is a 10-year-old, they're reading at college level already. So my question to you all here in this room, how can we as a community um, start to plant that seed of dual enrollment classes offered by the University of Arizona through the Office of Early Academic Outreach, their MESA program, hopefully the reemergence of the Academic Preparation for Excellence program known as APEX. So that's my question. How can we as a community working at Pima Community College at the University of Arizona, how can we partnership so that by the time our students are graduating from high school, have already completed at minimum their general education courses, or they've already completed their bachelor's degree so that by the time they're 18 to 20 years old, they're working on their master's degree. Um, my knowledge on this is limited, I'll admit, but there is um, another title, a Title V grant on campus, Project Familia, that is really trying to tackle this in the math space. Um, one of the challenges with dual enrollment is um, high school teachers not having the necessary credentials for college credit courses. So that project looks at pairing um, graduate students with high school classroom teachers to co in a co-teaching model. Um, I think there's a lot of room to grow. Of course, one of the barriers also is tuition. Who pays the tuition? Does the university offer discounted tuition? That's a huge barrier. Um, I couldn't agree more. And I think while we're also thinking about these high achieving students who can benefit from dual enrollment, I think we also need to recognize how K-12 education in Arizona has been decimated over the past few decades. Um, I've been here at the U of A for 15 years now, and I can't tell you how many times I've heard, especially STEM faculty saying, oh, these students, they, they're not what they used to be. They're just, well, no, they're not what they're used, they used to be. K-12 is not what it used to be. Um, I took AP Calculus at Amphi High School in the 80s, as I said, you know, I guarantee you AP Calculus is not offered anymore at Amphi High School in this current era. Um, so I think there's work to do on both sides. How do we really serve those high achieving students who can excel 
Um, some schools do have some decent dual enrollment credits. My son was at like through JTED. So how do we expand partnerships with JTED, partnerships with high schools um, and move the institution to think about breaks, financial breaks, tuition waivers, how can we better support all of that work? But I welcome anyone else with knowledge in the room about dual enrollment or comments about it. To this also, is the, um, Lupe is part of the title five, title five. So if you want to say anything, and then maybe if Marla wants to say anything, um, can you get the? Good afternoon. So I'm the manager outreach for the Project Outreach Familia Grant, and uh, you said a lot of things that are correct. Um, the dual enrollment piece is challenging for the reasons you mentioned the credentialing of teachers. So we're working with teachers right now. And then also, um, there's a lot of pieces to it too. Like dual enrollment for Pima has a system where the student doesn't incur any cost, but the districts have pay for some of the tuition and so forth. U of A doesn't have a model currently for that. There is a cost that students have to incur. And when we're talking about the populations we're working with, it's a challenge. So we're currently working through all the systems right now. We do work with early academic outreach. We do the college academy for parents at the schools and we help the students with outreach. We have four partner schools right now, Rincon, Catalina, uh, Pueblo and Rio Rico. So um, there's different elements, but what you just mentioned takes years and years of working. I've been doing this work for 20 plus years and uh, <laughs> we, may, we take a couple steps forward and then there's new legislation that puts us back. So it's a matter of continuing to do the work. Um, a lot of us in this room have been doing this work for many years. And I think what the lady said up there is true. Um, if we come together so that when there's more funding, we kind of upscale rather than recreate, um, that'll continue to help us. So we are partnering with a lot of the ladies up there to do some of the strategic planning so that we have some um, sustainability models. So yeah, it takes a lot of work. <laughs> it does take a village and uh, we're doing our best that we can, but it's impossible with four staff, five staff. So, but we're doing our best. Thank, Thank you, you, Lupe. Um, I wanted to just kind of chime in here a little. We don't have, um, for our ACES program, we typically are recruiting students who are kind of like the middle of the road. So they're not like 4.0, probably going to thrive without our program kind of thing, because we, we only have a cap of how much we can serve because there's so much capacity our staff has to support the needs that are, that the students who they're in the middle need. Um, so I'm not sure if that question quite fits with our program exactly, except for that they'd be younger and might need the maturity and the growth and development aspect. Um, and so some of those pieces make me think of the transfer side of our program and um, what we're doing with our side, specifically with our STEM, uh, NSF STEM grant, um, is that we've reached out to our partners at Pima Community College to offer mentorship to students while they're at Pima. And while we're at, in our last year of that grant, and we've already recruited the final cohort of those students, we've started to offer some of that peer mentorship to students while they're at community college, whether it's at Pima Community College or Maricopa or some of these others. Um, once we're starting to hear from students who are having questions and maybe want to connect with a peer to have that, um, conversation and get a little bit more like personal or have that personal connection. And um, that's something that we've been able to do on the transfer side that, that maybe this could be an opportunity that Lou, that we could also engage with our high school students. I know we do high school student reach out with our first year recruitment um, side of the program, um, but that maybe could be another opportunity as well. Thanks for the conversation. Great, great. And thought. All right. Well, thank you again, everyone, for coming. Um, feel free. I don't know if there's anything, any desserts or anything left in the back, but yes, I'm getting the thumbs up if you want to grab a dessert. Um, thank you so much for coming. Again, uh, we welcome everyone uh, partnering in this work, uh, everyone's efforts across campus. 
um, to help achieve a more inclusive and equitable and accessible and positive STEM culture and environment on this campus. Please think about coming to our event on December 6th. It's gonna start at 10 a.m. in the courtyard of ENR2, um, but we really um, are excited about digging into the data. We're happy to share, as Kimberly mentioned, any of these reports with you, full reports. We just shared some snippets today, but we have a, the actual institutional self-study is like a 30 page report, but there's lots of other data in there that we didn't share today. Um, and especially if you're someone who likes strategic planning, if you like thinking about real policy and practice change that could come from a strategic plan, um, we really, really invite you to become part of this AAASC change program. Um, and if you can't come to the event on December 6th, there's, there will be other opportunities to learn about it um, and join it. So thank you everyone for coming and have a great day, a great week, a great holiday.